take this island like a dose of medicine to heal your centuries of wandering. Find yourself here as if in a dream, emerging from the mists of afternoon thunderstorms. Waterfalls pound your head into shape. Let the sea beat your longing out of you. But you sense spirits here. Restless spirits to whom no priest or pundit bid farewell. You have not forgotten them. Like the names of your ancestors, strange names of disparate tongues from far-flung places. Let this island medicine intoxicate you. Let the liquor dance, a spirit dance in your veins. It is paradise lost. A paradise of loss. This is where you come to find yourself. This is where much has disappeared into the forest, into the cane fields. Among the lost things of this island, find yourself whole again. For over a decade, the British artist Chris Ophelia has made the Caribbean island of Trinidad his home. For me, one of the attractive things about Trinidad is it's still quite mysterious. I've been there for 12 years, and it still feels like it's brand new, completely starting again, and creatively um, wide open. From his explosive early works, featuring riotous colors, collage, and infamously elephant dung, Chris Avili has always pushed the possibilities of painting. But his time in Trinidad has been a creative rebirth. There's so much of it, and it's so powerful. Um, density of the forest, the depth of the ocean, the beauty on the surface. It's just a very kind of painterly island. One of my challenges, it feels, is to find a way to bring those elements together and for them to coexist, but still be, still be themselves, still have that character. His latest project attempts just this. It's a remarkable collaboration, a giant tapestry, almost three meters high and over seven meters wide, but is the centerpiece of a new Ophelia exhibition at the National Gallery in London. Created alongside a team of master weavers, it's taken nearly three years to complete. The result is a magical piece that weaves together the sights and sounds of Trinidad with nods to both the classical world and, unexpectedly, the Italian footballer Mario Balotelli. And he's called it the Caged Bird Song. It brings to mind the idea of the question of sweetness of the song. is the sweeter song, the song of the uncaged bird, or the song of the caged bird, and what that really is asking about liberation and constraint, and how that could potentially relate to being human.
The story begins four and a half thousand miles away from Trinidad in Edinburgh. This former Victorian swimming baths is home to Dovecot Studios, one of the world's leading creators of hand-woven tapestries. Back in 2013, the studio was approached by the Cloth Workers, a London livery company with a rich textile history, who were looking to make a bold new commission. We were hoping for a contemporary, a modern, vibrant tapestry, and we were looking for an established, outstanding British artist. Dovecote came up with a shortlist, and then when we found that Chris was very keen to experiment outside his usual field, to go into tapestry, we were absolutely delighted. The cloth workers wrote and, and asked if I would consider making a, a tapestry for their dining hall, which to me at the time seemed like a commission, which is something that I would normally run away from because I felt that the fear is that they would want to have a say in what I produce, um, which I think raised a level of anxiety that I didn't really want to <laughs> take on. So um, I think I sent back a number of like questions and there were pretty much a list of things that I wasn't going to do. Like, I didn't want to see where it was going to go. I didn't want to meet them. And I didn't want to have a conversation about content. That's rather brilliant. <laughs> so on every front, you yeah. just mix them. Yeah, and they were, they were like, yeah, that's no problem. No problem, no problem. Then I got more suspicious. <laughs> so now, now they're agreeing to everything. That means that um, they've got something up their sleeve. <laughs> The way that Chris works with colours really is fascinating, and we thought that would very much fulfil the bill. We wanted a Chris Ophelia piece. We wanted him to be happy. At home in Trinidad, Ophelia created a vibrant design for the tapestry, a triptych painted rather mischievously in watercolour. I thought about watercolour because the subject is pretty much about water and fluidity. And I also thought it would be funny to see if the weavers could actually weave um, water. water. <laughs> so I found myself making the watercolour and trying to release the pigment even more and almost giggling at the fact that it was almost impossible for them to, to achieve it. There's no way they're going to be able to do this. <laughs> so let's just sit back and watch. But when I came with the watercolour and met them, they had a kind of solidity to them and a confidence, created confidence about their own process. Thankfully, they were really open to the challenge of it and also open to the mystery as to whether or not they could achieve it. For the weavers, it was a major undertaking. To create a tapestry of this size and complexity would take years of their lives, an investment of thousands of hours. Haven't you chosen something quite challenging because watercolours must be incredibly difficult to, to weave and to do as tapestries? Yes, I agree. And the watercolour is like multi-layered, so you're often looking at the colours underneath to come up through Mm -hmm. as well, rather than just a block of colour. So yes. the mixing is very important. Day one, they did a colour strip, wove it in front of me, and they started to put together threads to make that turquoise fizz in front of my eyes when you look at it as a solid colour. And I realised that was completely different to my understanding of it. And so I, I, I felt as though I could just let go and, and float with this process. These are the bobbins that we use for weaving with. If you're wanting to weave something that looks all the same colour but you don't want it to look flat like cardboard, you would make a mix with very close colours and then it would just gently mm -hmm. look like the same colour. If 
if you twist it like that, you get more of an idea of what it's going to weave up like. So these are more subtle, different variations of these colours. I can see yeah. these. That's right, yeah. 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 I think we lifted the colour from the original image. So there are right. almost no pure colour in here, is there? It's all a mix, but which watercolour yeah. is, yes. really. Yeah, yes. it's different. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Making those mixtures means that we can get the subtlety and the richness but it also means that we can blend one colour into another to get that. The sort of watercolour effect. Watercolour and wool yeah. are such completely different yes. materials. He's a master colourist, Chris Afili, so he wanted to challenge them by using watercolour pigment, which is the most free-flowing of the pigments. And so you get this wonderful paradox between this spontaneous, very free-flowing artist's medium, which then becomes this permanent, fixed, three-dimensional object of a tapestry. There is a great variation in the watercolors themselves, very lush and then almost non-color, mm. the use of charcoal. Mid I call them midweek colors. Midweek colors. Yeah, midweek mid -week colors, and yeah. the weekend colors are the, the popping colors that you get around. On the right-hand side, you've got the male figure carrying the birdcage, and he's drawn in charcoal, and his clothing is turquoise. I remember putting the turquoise down, and the colour just suddenly starts to bleed really quickly. I remember thinking, oh, no, I screwed it up, right? It's out of control. And then I just thought, this is kind of hilarious, that they are now going to capture that moment and I still see it when I look at it. You're a bit of a sadist, aren't you? Really? <laughs> no, no. I think it was just to see if um, we could, it was a way of trying to have a dialogue, really. So what are the actual narrative within the Feely's tapestry design? Both the glowing color palette and much of its imagery draws inspiration from his adopted island home of Trinidad, including that of the caged bird. I could go into full investigation and get, try and get to the bottom of the caged bird phenomenon, but I like, I, I like to almost observe it from a distance. You could be running around the savannah and somebody would come in towards you, walk in, and they're carrying a little bird in a cage. And then you can go to these competitions, which is like a kind of orchestra of little birds in cages, singing, you know. In the mornings in Trinidad, this incredible bird song. Keeping songbirds is a surprisingly macho subculture on the island. The birds are fed a local seed grass known as crab eye to help them perform to the best of their abilities. I grew up into it. My grandfather used to mind them, my father, and now I have them. Right? I inherit some of them from, even from my grandfather. These birds have lived long. These birds live up to like 30, 35 years, human years, in cage. The notes that the birds sing are just pleasing to, to my ear. I rather listen to my birds than to play music. <laughs> I like that song. It's sweeter. <laughs> We just love the birds. <laughs> it's all about the birds. <laughs> I haven't to this day got myself my own cage bird, but every time I go to somebody's home and I see one there on the porch, I do think it's a beautiful thing to be able to have around. Some of the songs of these cage birds are just divine, really, really divine. So sweet and um, they really just kind of captivate you and throw you into a, an, another kind of world, really. Chris, he appreciates what, what we have here. But this place is just such a rich bed for anyone who wants to study culture and people and the various nuances associated with such, you know? Especially those who have a 
you know, particular creative energy. I think it's very, uh, very inspiring, very inspiring. The natural world has been a huge source of delight for him, and you really see this in the works that he made since he moved to Trinidad. It's a tropical world. The colors are more vivid. The birds sing more loudly. The, you know, the sun shines more brightly. He's not the only artist to have moved to that kind of island paradise in the past. And I think it's inevitable that what you see around you becomes, becomes part of the landscape, becomes part of your repertoire. One of the interesting things about a great artist is that they often make a story their own. And you can see Chris doing that. You know, what you're looking at, really, in the tapestry is what could be seen as a curtain being pulled back for a brief moment and what's happening behind the curtain. And then when the curtain closes again, the man holding the cage bird and the lady holding the bird seat continue back on their, on their journey. But just to try to understand the journey you went on, yeah. this is, in the end, one image, but, but you went through lots and lots of different stages. You didn't just arrive at that idea. Mm. There was a point at which I was quite clear on what the image was going to be, but I wanted to be able to render it with ease. And so in order to do that, you kind of have to go through a few different iterations, really, of the same thing to see what happens when a curve moves left instead of right, or a stroke is done from the bottom up or top down and it's just to see which flows better. And the fluidity is also part of the process of making and not only just the, the image itself. This sense of flow and the presence of water is everywhere in Ophelia's early designs for the piece. A couple sit by a waterfall with a river swirling around them. The man is busy serenading while the woman sips a cocktail. And the cocktail is being poured by a strange abstracted figure based on an image of the Italian footballer Mario Balotelli in tears. So, Chris, where does it, does it all begin with Mario? Um, I was interested in the fact that maybe the tears could, could, his tears could become part of the cocktail. Ah. Oh. Yeah, that there's this kind of deep underlying sadness to him that's been transferred into this potion or drink. But in this case, I wanted to really collage the, the image that I was working from, staple it on and for it to be there still in its raw state. And later became these drawings. This watercolour as well. Using Mario Balotelli as a muse connects various threads in Ophelia's own story. Born and raised in Manchester to Nigerian parents, Chris's explorations of race and Afro-identity, both playful and serious, have always been a distinctive feature of his work. In 1998, he won the Turner Prize for paintings that included a poignant depiction of Doreen Lawrence grieving her son Stephen's brutal murder. For me, it's about trying to make a painting about tremendous loss. I mean, I focused on the image that was strongest to me, which was of Doreen, his mother, crying. And 
that just seemed like such a powerful image. When I finished the painting, it felt like that raw emotion, that sorrow was actually, it felt like that was actually in the room. As for Balotelli, the son of Ghanaian immigrants to Sicily, he was later fostered by an Italian family. But his footballing gifts are often overshadowed by his own volatile reputation and racism within the game. I'm a Manchester United supporter. He played for, for Man City. So I can't in my heart say that I think he's a wonderful footballer, right? Because he's wearing the wrong color shirt. But I think there are other qualities to him that are outside of his um, abilities as a sportsman. Qualities that uh, seem uh, much more mythical. I think, you know, the fact that he's in black, African, Italian. He is complex, he is mischievous, but also tortured. He symbolizes the way race plays a part still in sport. I think he's a maverick in a, in a way that you don't often get. I've worked with, with you know, images of him before, and this is another one. I'm still trying to figure it out and it's not, it's not fixed. And I think with him, it's also not fixed. So I've cast him in this sense as a cocktail waiter. Which you, well, you, you've done a bit of cocktail. I've done, yeah, I've done that too, yeah. And, and I, I like that idea of almost being in, in disguise, really, but you also are able to take on a, another personality or another persona. Is that because when you were doing it, you were trying to kind of get a glimpse of the world as it was, and so you were see out it there? Differently. Yeah, to yeah. try and see things differently momentarily and not be yourself and to play the part thoroughly. You get to see something else, you know. There are, you know, let's just say there were great cocktail waiters in the world. There must be something other than just mixing drinks. <laughs> you, know, you might get to see people um, differently. Adopting masks and alternative personas has deep cultural roots in Trinidad. Much of the island's multicultural population is a colonial legacy. Generations of African slaves and indentured Indian laborers toiled on its sugar and cocoa plantations. When we think about the Amerindians who lived here, that this place was based and constructed, if you want, on their slaughter. You know, on African enslavement. Indian indenture, and these are things which we have to, to, to look at to see where we go from there. Trinidad's annual carnival is a visceral celebration that emerged from slave rebellion. When rebellion is put down, as most of them have been, the idea that people re revolt on behalf of or against do not disappear. The people's attitude to these things also doesn't disappear, right? What happens is that this moves into the culture. And that is why art and culture function in such, you know, subversive ways in a kind of way, because you're looking for them to frontally to be saying one thing and then they're saying something else, you know.
It's a very interesting thing about our carnival. We have like this whole pantheon of devils. In our mythology, we have so many shapeshifters. You know, there's so many characters that change perspective and change their outward appearance to achieve certain things. When you put on a costume, especially a blue devil, you become uninhibited. You know what I mean? So your energy is raw. It's raw. You kind of cast away your inhibitions. And as you see in Trinidad, you free up yourself. It's, it's flowing and it's free. I don't know, maybe that's part of what Chris, he experiences here, a certain level of freedom. The thing about Chris is that he, he disappears in a place like this. He doesn't stand out in that sense. His blackness includes him in the society in a way that if he was a white artist, he would not. His otherness is different here than it would be in England. For somebody who, who is a transplant from somewhere else, but a transplant from somewhere else that he doesn't know at all. There is a kind of familiarity about the place. The mythology, the, the, the history, mm. the, the fact that Trinidad is full of people you know, with different histories. Mm. Did you just somehow absorb that and then sort of filter it into your mm. story? Mm. I think it's an ongoing process. I mean, um, I think for me, one of the attractive things about Trinidad is it's still quite mysterious. And you think you're going in one direction, and you realize that you're actually not going in that direction. If anything, it's kind of kept, thi it's kept things open and um, allowed um, it to feel, still feel like a kind of life is still coll being collaged together as I go along. Meanwhile, bringing Ophelia's watercolour design to life remains a daunting task for the weavers. And yet the whole art of tapestry making is incredibly exacting and labour intensive. For centuries, tapestries were cherished for these very reasons. They were to the north of Europe what fresco was to the south. Vast projections of power, wealth, and sophistication. Henry VIII's personal collection would have stretched three miles if laid end to end. But the intricate processes involved in creating tapestry have changed very little over the years. Everything has to be made from scratch and Ophelia's original watercolors dramatically scaled up. One of the reasons we were really looking forward to working with Chris after his work doing some set designs, the backdrops for the ballet, we thought that he can imagine his work on that sort of scale. And so we knew that they would work well. That's your a photocopy, is it? It's yeah. a photo, yes, you can see at the bottom it says, please enlarge by 877%. <laughs> So from that we get a line drawing that we call the cartoon. So you can see these lines here, mm. which is quite a laborious process. Is it? Why, why is that? Each mark has to be made not just on the front of the warp thread, but also all the way around. Wow, I so can the... see what you mean. <laughs> so this could take weeks. <laughs> When we're looking at the lines that are actually on the warps, we are constantly referring back to the image with the small cartoons sitting over the top. Already from this conversation, I can see how exhausting this must be. <laughs> is You've got uh -huh. to work systematically through the image. At the back of the tapestry here, you can see as the tapestry is woven, it's rolled down onto this bottom roller. So these are sections which have already been Waving. Oh, that's beautiful. Then once it's rolled down, we won't see that again until it's, the tapestry is cut off the loom. 
Over the two and a half years that we've been talking and working together, what I've observed is that they weave their, their lives and their souls into the work. So it's not something that you can just sit around um, knitting, chewing gum and watching daytime TV at the same time. You really have to be engaged fully, but also in some ways quite detached, you know? Because you can't, I mean, when they're doing it, they're doing it an inch at a time, or whatever it is, that they're, yeah. they're able to do it. So it's millions of decisions. I know, and yet you can't see the whole. So the emotional engagement, yeah. which goes into, and which you can see in the yeah. result, yeah. is all the more surprising. Yeah, because they might, there, were, there were passages in there where they may be in a kind of meditation on greys and greens for three weeks and then it shifts all of a sudden to a, a, a violet or a turquoise. And I know that at those moments, they're almost like kind of woken from a from reverie or, or a dream. And they're like, you know, is this too much? You know, is the shift too drastic? <laughs> what happened? And I think that comes out of not being able to see the image. It's just suddenly they, there's a kind of jarring. At the centre of this is this sort of magician figure. It's something very playful about it, but also mm. very mysterious about mm. it. You don't know quite that pouring of a cocktail mm. in there. It's you green. don't know where it's going. It's to go. green. <laughs> yeah, it's a green cocktail. It's unknown if it's poison or if it's enhancing. It's falling as well, so she's unaware that it's falling into the glass. She's listening to the music. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. listens to music, the guy's yeah. playing some beautiful music by the waterfall, and she's drinking a cocktail. I like the idea that in the foreground, you can almost feel the spray from the waterfall on yeah. their faces. When you get a bubbly cocktail, you get the bubbles that go on your face just as you drink the first sip. It's a wonderful moment of um, a couple in their own joyous world. It's a tropical Adam and Eve on an island paradise. So it's a kind of vision of Arcadia. It's a vision of paradise, but a temporary. It's a temporary state. And it's as though there's a darkening to come. When you see Arcadian visions in paintings of the past, whether by Cezanne or going all the way back to Titian, often it's a vision which is somehow threatened. There is something on the horizon which suggests it, it is changing, something is about to happen, something is about to take place. They're exposed, the curtains being pulled back and they're not aware, and also there's something being added to the mix. But also in the distance, there's this brooding storm that's approaching. Trinidad is, is, is a land of extremes. We have extreme beauty, um, but we also have an extreme ugliness too. We have a crime situation that we need to address. I work for the government. Um, and, and primarily, it's, it's a program that, uh, you know, does social outreach um, and, and community organizing within uh, uh, high-needs communities and, and get them to address the risk factors that, uh, you know, that contribute to, to crime and violence within the communities and with the aim of obviously reducing it and preventing it as much as we can. It's a kind of paradise that is not without problems. It's riddled with problems. But for me, that makes it, dare I say, more attractive because you're looking at the kind of reality. It's not hidden away. It's truth. At times, it's almost too true. You know, newspaper photography really spells out what happened when that person was murdered 
you could be sat looking at the most beautiful rolling hills in the background at the same time as looking at, you know, the daily news, which is harrowing at times. I think it is a place of extremes. In some ways, it seems very industrial. There's oil and natural gas in the processing of, so you get, you feel as though you're not in a tropical island, you're actually in an industrial island. And then within 20 minutes, you can be in a, a, in a forest and have no feeling of that whatsoever. And shortly after, you can be right on the coastline and, and be like experiencing your own fragility and feeling terrified in, in the waves and seeing like, you know, the force and swells and see the way light has an effect on the movement of water. And it can be very, very um, beautiful, but very raw. I mean, Chris is a guy, you know, since I've met him really and truly, he loves the sea, the river, the waterfalls, you know, going into the bush, he has his hunting dogs. He doesn't necessarily hunt, but he has hunting dogs that he takes into the, the, the tracks and stuff quite regularly, you know? And he goes, he'll go by himself with his dogs, you know? So it's not even to say it's a, it's a social thing. It's just to, to reconnect and stay connected to that, to that source. He most probably knows the island better than a lot of locals, to be quite honest. You don't see colors like this anywhere else. As far as I know, Chris actually works with those people who make paint to get the specific color, <laughs> you know? You know, he's, he's very nerdy about things like that, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah, I just got this. It's like, it's like this really specific blue, you know? It's, yeah, cool, okay. <laughs> yeah. The landscape deserves that attention, so they're, they're well suited to each other, Chris and the landscape. Places that I've gone to, like various waterfalls, it serves me best to visit and revisit and revisit and revisit. Whereas I think in other instances, you feel as though you can get it the first time. Maybe a bit like a waterfall, this kind of never ending process that it never quite is the same. And maybe what I'm really talking about is the power of nature rather than just us as, as human beings. This hunting, this is part of what you're doing. You're, you're looking, you're seeing, you're, yeah. your mood is changing, you're, yeah. you're seeing things in a, from a different yeah. perspective all yeah. the time. Yeah, it's conscious, yeah. yeah. It's a con I'm consciously going to um, be inspired by something. For me, one of the very intriguing and beguiling things about him as an artist is his willingness to take his painting into other areas and to adapt his style to meet different needs and different requirements. Many of the artists who hang on the walls of the National Gallery, Goya, Rubens, Bronzino, Pisanello, many, many of these artists have in the past designed for tapestry. And so by placing Chris Ophelia in this context, he becomes part of the tapestry tradition. 
this wonderful tradition that has been going on for centuries. It's taken 29 months, over 6,000 hours of endeavor and 35 kilos of wool. But the weaver's work is done. Their final act, weaving their initials alongside Chris's into the fabric of the tapestry. All that remains is for the last section to be freed from the loom in a traditional ceremony called the cutting off. This phrase, the cutting off, today is the cutting off, it's a, it's a startling phrase <laughs> anyway, but what does it mean? I guess the, the thought is that it's quite final and after that, there's very little you can do to change the outcome. And you know, all of our efforts have already happened. There's a sense of relief as well sometimes mm -hmm. that that's it finished. Yeah. And it is what it is now. And how are you feeling about Chris Ophelia turning up today? Maybe slightly nervous, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think his incredible positivity about what we're doing and the way we've done it and it reaffirms that we're we're translating his image in a way that he's really pleased with what's your life going to be like without <laughs> <laughs> i don't know because it's etched so deeply in there now <laughs> <laughs> good to see you yeah 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 exciting moment absolutely Thanks first, Chris, to you. I wonder whether I might just paraphrase, and I don't know whether I'll get this right, but it was a Hermann Hesse quote, in New Beginnings dwells a magic force. And I think we really sensed that there was a magic force, Chris, the first day that you came to the studio and took time to talk with the weaving team, to talk tapestry and to explore ideas. And so that magic force seems to have gone on through the three years of this project. And so how appropriate, of course, that the exhibition in the National Gallery should be called Weaving Magic. Today will be the very first time anyone has seen the final panel. Three sections of the finished tapestry can now be revealed as one unified work of art. When you saw it today, mm. what impact did it have on you? What did you make of it? Spellbinding was, was the word that came to mind. A, there is a kind of magic in it, really. I know how it's been made, and I, I understand it, but still, <laughs> you know, still you're looking at it, and you're like, hang on a minute. That's a pool of pigment, but it's been rendered in, in wool. But it's still a pool of pigment. It's still, they still manage to maintain those qualities.
one of the astonishing things about seeing a contemporary tapestry is its color, because historic tapestries, they fade, they're very, very susceptible to the effects of light, particularly blue colors. So it's very unusual to see a historic tapestry with any blue in it. And Chris Ophelia's tapestry is full of blue. So I think that the color will amaze people, the depth of color. And I don't think anyone had any idea of the pinks, the kind of rose-tinted yellows that suddenly came out in that third panel. I mean, the story of making this tapestry is the story of many, many people's hard work. It is extraordinary to see an object that has taken almost three years to make, five people, often three of them, sitting at the loom at the same time. It's that collaborative, collective act. And it's the quality of human time, which I think is embedded into the tapestry and I think is one of the reasons why it is such an alluring object to look at. For his National Gallery exhibition, Chris Ophelia, the master conjurer, has one final flourish up his sleeve. In a complete transformation of the gallery's Sunley room, He's worked with scenic painters from the Royal Opera House to adorn every inch of wall space with a towering frieze of androgynous dancing figures. When I decided that I was going to paint the room with this imagery, I still never knew how it was going to relate to the colour decisions that we made in the tapestry. And in a way that excited me because I was really anxious to know if that was going to work. The only thing missing is the tapestry itself. To mark the occasion, Chris has brought his kids along for the install. He's a very good decision maker. He, he holds back, but he knows when he needs to make a decision, and he always makes a good one. Where was it? Um, yeah, do you want to put it there, then? Just, just lower it, let's see the hand. Just lower your side. giant tapestries, though, is harder than it looks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks. So how does it feel, Chris? Every time I come in, I'm still a bit like, wow, what's going on here? You know, still trying to figure it out. I enjoy the, the grisaille of the walls and then this popping out of colour. The whole room and the images contained within the room feel like a dream state. I 
And I must say, it's hallucinogenic, you know. This yes, it is. Yes, it is. It could end up being a little unstable. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, you step back and you're like, whoa, there's a lot all of a sudden. <laughs> What are you expecting, what are you hoping for from the public reaction when they come in here seeing this for the first time? I hope in some ways that the people visiting can almost approach this in a similar way that the weavers did, that they can find an opportunity in being in this room to immerse themselves somehow in the work. My first <laughs> feeling was, wow. The colours are just amazing. I love the feel of it. It's just a really sort of stunning but subtle effect. I don't know how they did it. And was this mysterious liquid flowing into her cocktail glass? It looks like it's flowing. There's no end to it, really. It could go on and on and on and on. just couldn't actually believe that it was a tapestry. The bleed across in the greens and the purples, it just takes your breath away, really. I mean, the main feeling that I wanted in coming into the room was to give it a kind of temple quality, that you are walking into a room that is depicting something that's not necessarily of this time and place and that it's a place of worship in some ways, but a place of joy and, and repose in other ways. And that the tapestry is the main feature in the room, but also is part of this narrative. But it was important for me that it's not fixed, that somehow the story's got lost in time and that we can bring our own meanings to it. A bit like when you go and visit ancient spaces elsewhere that you can understand it in terms of its power and what the meaning it may have had in the past, but it's not so clear what that is now. From afar, you can see all the colours, but when you get close, you can kind of almost feel the movement of the tapestry. You can see the expressions on the people's faces, and it's just really nice to be able to look and almost like wonder what they're thinking. No matter how close you get to it, it's still, it's still a mystery. Every one of these lines is, is different. Yeah, because these lines are charcoal. And then these, these areas here are all like little flecks of charcoal that are floating in the watercolour and then settle. Some of the things for me that are arbitrary for them have to be absolutely deliberate. So the breaking up of a line of charcoal when it's magnified, how many times they magnify, become other colours. Yes. And they have to register everything. And in their diligence, they create something completely other. And that's, that's where I think in that gap of their intention and what they achieve, that's where the magic occurs. In the cloud, that really seems to be a sort of explosive, doesn't mm. it? That's what that feels like. It yeah. feels like it's sort of out of control. You can almost hear the rumble. You've got that kind of lushness, but also there's sort of quite stormy skies. Wonderful contrast, really special. When I think of the world we inhabit, everyone yeah. will think, oh, this was done digitally. Yeah. Everyone will imagine yeah. this was done in that way. And it yeah. wasn't. It was done no. by hand over no. days and weeks and months and years. I mean, that's what's, oddly enough, what makes it so mysterious and special. I think so. I think something happens creatively when human beings don't exclude their soul and spirit in the making of something. And when it's over a long period of time, I don't think you can exclude your soul and spirit. And you see that somehow that will translate in the work. I actually think it's quite an ancient approach because our, our 
relationship to time now is changing. Our emphasis now is on doing things quickly rather than what happens when we do things slowly. So I think in terms of making art, though, when things are done slowly because they can't be done quickly, we get something else. Mr. Christopher Ophelia for services to art. While overseeing the installation of the exhibition, Chris has also been honored with a CBE. This is about your role as a British artist and an acknowledgement of what you've done. I mean, how was that? Pretty quick, um, <laughs> but um, chatty. Just wonder what he said to you. You know, once you get anything like a CBE, certainly at that level, you have to um, sign a uh, Official Secrets Act. <laughs> and um, any conversations with a member of the royal family falls within that bracket of the Official Secrets Act. I can't discuss... Oh, you fibber. What we... <laughs> I don't believe you. What we <laughs> spoke about. He was curious about this that's coming on, so I think he said he might try and take a look. It's nice to be recognised for what you do, especially if what you do is on your own terms. I'm very much a product of the empire. My parents um, have a British passport as a result of coming from Nigeria. And also, my children have British passports through birth, but also Trinidad was once part of the empire. So in, in, in many ways, I understand the idea of the empire. Although there are negative connotations, there are also um, many positive ones. It feels good to be a positive product of what we consider to be the empire. Here you are, I mean, I see you connected to this and to Trinidad and to Britain, mm. to Nigeria, and mm. all these other places. Mm. But also you're connected to Titian and Goya and Rembrandt and mm. this great tradition of art, and, and that's obviously important to you. I think I would be the first lamb they would, they would slaughter if I was in amongst that lot, but... Well, you are amongst that lot, they're yeah. next door. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. It's actually, it's a privilege to be looked at by the same eyes, audience, that has just looked at a Titian. Mm. and um, I'm happy that I'm not in the same room. Mi gallina, en el monte vino a ver. Mi gallina, en el monte vino a ver. Mi gallina, en el monte que la trajo el macabrero. 